Um, today we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12, just two verses we're going to look at today. Um, but before we get into that text, it was two weeks ago, I shared a little bit about the conflict in Israel, you know, and we had such feedback, such great feedback from that sharing time that we've packaged that and put it on our website as a continued resource with some other resources as well. And so if you did not hear that two weeks ago and you want to take advantage of that, you can go to our website and, uh, and, and have that equipping. Um, today is day 12. Here we are in this series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And I challenged our elders, let's spend 30 days in prayer regarding the direction of our church. Here we're going through this, Lord, teach us to pray. And if we're going to get serious about prayer, then we need to expect that God's going to answer it. And today is day 12 of 30 days that I've challenged our elders to be praying regarding the direction of our church. And I invite you to join us, to join us each day. We're on day 12 of 30 days that we'd be praying for God to lead us and to give us direction that as we are seeking him and seeking him for direction, that we might receive from him what it is that he wants for us. And we might be good stewards of the leadership responsibility that we have. And I invite you to, to join the leadership of this church in praying in that way. I'm gonna pray that way right now. Father God, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come together and to be in your word. Lord, we pray, teach us what you wanna teach us. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to seek you. And I pray specifically for the elders of our church, Lord, that we would be humble, that we would put pride and arrogance aside, and that we would be submissive to you and your leadership, that we might receive from you the direction that you wanna give. And so God, help us. We're coming to you and, and we're seeking you for your wisdom and your direction, and we ask that you would help us. Lord, continue to be at work in our church family, in our own lives, in our households. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's family said, amen, amen. amen. Well, I'll begin in this way. When you think about the last seven days, what is it that you typically pray for when you pray? If you took all the prayers of the last seven days that you have prayed and you wrote them out and I read the transcript of the last seven days of your prayers, what would I read? When you pray, when we pray, what do we typically pray for? You know, one of the things I find interesting is that towns have mottos. Our town has a motto. I've lived in this town my entire life. You go through downtown and there's a motto that hangs over the town. And the motto is water, wealth, contentment, health. It's pretty easy to figure out. All I have to do is drive out of my subdivision. You know what I find? A farm. And then there's another farm next to it. And there's another farm next to it. And farms need water which is why there's canals that are running all through our town because that's supplying all the water for the farms. It's pretty easy to understand why that's a part of the banner of our town. Wealth, I think I understand that. Contentment, I think I understand what that means. Health, I think I understand that. What I thought about this week, do my prayers just look like the banner over our town? and my prayers never make it beyond the categories that are represented in the banner over my town? Do my prayers stop there, where those are the only subjects that I'm praying about? Or do my prayers get to a place that's higher about some higher things that God would want me to be praying about? In Matthew chapter six, I'm gonna read some from Matthew chapter six before we get to 2 Thessalonians 1. In Matthew chapter six, it says this, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. This is the first time this passage says anxious. So I just pay attention to how many times the word anxious comes up in this passage. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious, there it is again, second time in this passage, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious? There it is a third time. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, who was very wealthy, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious. A fourth time. 
I think God's trying to tell us something. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So instead of being focused on all these things, seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious. The fifth time, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious. The sixth time, tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I made a huge mistake two weeks ago. I went to the mall. And I put something together in my life that I had never put together before. When I go to the mall, the focus of the mall is literally all the things this passage is saying do not worry about. And so I walk into an environment where the focus of the environment is the subjects that Jesus is saying do not worry about. And I wonder why when I go to the mall that I feel so stressed out. Because it's an environment that's having me focus on things that Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. If my focus is going to be on what goes in my body and what goes on my body, and that's where my focus is, is all about my body, I'm going to be experiencing being anxious. And he's like, don't have that be your focus. Don't have that be your focus. So what should our focus be? When we pray, what does God want us to pray for? There are a number of of ways that we can learn this. We've been looking for two months at the Lord's Prayer. So clearly, if you go back to our messages over the last two months, you can can see some, hey, these are some ways that God wants us to be praying. Today, we're going to look at another example. It's a prayer that the Apostle Paul prays, and it's very short. It's very short, but it is powerful It's 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12. I'll read this prayer. So Paul says, To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in you and him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read it again. To this end, we always pray for you. He's saying, this is our prayer for you. The Apostle Paul, this is our prayer for you. This is how we pray for you. That our God may make you worthy of his calling, may fulfill every resolve for good, and every work of faith by his power. Those three things. So that, here's the result, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So how can we learn from his prayer? Three prayers for the saints of God. He's saying, I'm praying this for you. He's talking about believers and he's saying, this is how I'm praying for believers. The apostle Paul, this is how I'm praying for believers. So these are three prayers for the saints of God. What I want us to think about also though, is when we, you know, one of the, some of the times when I'm praying for my neighbors, some of the prayers that I pray for my neighbors are not yet prayers because I don't know that they know Jesus yet. And so I'm praying, God, would this be true in their life at some moment when they come to know you and the truth of your word might be true about them as well? What about my family members, my family members that are on my heart? You know, as we've been digging through in this prayer series, it's been impacting our church in a very significant way. It's been impacting my life in a very significant way. As I'm digging into prayer about my family, about my wife, about my kids, about our home. As we go through this text, it might be that we need to be reminded about what God desires for us as a follower of Jesus. So maybe keep some of this in mind as we walk through these three prayers for the saints of God. Prayer number one is worthiness, worthiness, worthiness. So he begins this very short prayer in verse 11 and verse 12. He begins in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11. It says, to this end, we always pray for you. So he's always praying in these ways. And the first one is that our God may make you worthy of his calling. He's asking that God would make God's people worthy of the calling that God has placed on his people. That's what he's praying. May God make you worthy 
of his calling. So the scriptures teach us a lot about the calling of God on our lives. So I'm going to share with you some passages. Romans 8, 28, it says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They can't be taken away. They can't be taken back. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. For you know, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul's saying, when I'm praying for you, I'm praying that you'd be worthy, you'd walk worthy, make God would make you worthy of his calling. Part of what we talk about when we talk about worthiness is we need to remember the worthiness is not based in us. The worthiness is based in the position that we have. Our worthiness in position. What do I mean about our worthiness in position? Well, let me explain that. In Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. That's my position apart from Jesus. So apart from Jesus, the wages of sin is death. That's my position. But... So amazing when the beautiful butt of God shows up in a verse, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my position is no longer sin and death because my position now is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's my new position. And so my worthiness is not based off of me because my own worthiness brought sin and death. My position is based off of Jesus because I'm in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know one of the lies the enemy just wants to shove down my throat? Your life has no value. Your life has no value. In fact, your life has no value, so you need to earn value for your life. So go earn it and go work hard. In fact, here's how you're gonna know your life is valuable when you do something in your life that has a dollar sign attached to it. Then your life's gonna be valuable because valuable time is billable time. That's the lie the enemy wants to shove down my throat, but that's not what my Bible teaches. My Bible teaches that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he decided, let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them in his image. My life has value because of the image of God. Not because of what I do, not because of what I bring, not because of how hard I work. My life has value because of the image of God. And it might be that this week, one of the great things you will do is you will just sit in the truth that your life is valuable because of Jesus. Your life has value because of God. And your position is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it might be all you need to do this week is just take a moment, sit down, and remember in Christ Jesus, our Lord, is where your value lies. It's in him. Let me give you a great place you could go and sit. On the Modesto campus, there is the BVG Prayer Garden, Big Valley Grace Prayer Garden. It was just redone by a team of volunteers. Great place if you need a place to go sit and be reminded that we have incredible value because of our position in Jesus. Our worthiness is because of our position in Jesus. There's also worthiness in practice. So we're following Jesus, and as we follow Jesus, our life is taking action. And so because we're in Christ, and we're following him in Christ, there's a practice of following Christ. Let me share some examples. 2 Thessalonians 1.5, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Tengu just shared with us that 24 years ago at the beginning of his ministry, his wife was diagnosed with lupus and his son was paralyzed from the chest down. That is the position he was in when God called him to serve. And then he experienced 14 years of his own perspective of a not very fruitful ministry of his perspective. It hasn't always been easy for him. He's sharing the gospel in the largest populated Muslim country on the planet. I'm guessing he's had some hard days. Hard days. And we can honor God even in the midst of suffering, no matter how hard it gets. 
2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. What does that mean? That means it's not a good plan to do nothing in Jesus. That's a bad plan. God wants us to follow him. He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to obey him. He wants us to walk with him. It's not a good plan to say, I'm going to be inactive with Jesus. This text used the word idle, idleness. It's a bad plan. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy. He's saying, I'm a prisoner for Jesus. And I'm challenging you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. So when we follow Jesus and we're walking in Jesus, it's gonna look like Jesus comes out of our life. The fruit of the Holy Spirit of God is gonna come out of our life. Philippians 1, 27 through 28, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So God's people working together for the gospel, working together to share Jesus, not frightened in anything by your opponents. And when we share the gospel, there will be opposition to sharing the gospel, not being frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. So even when it's hard and even when there's opposition, God's called us, follow me, follow me. Another passage, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Paul's saying, I don't stop praying for you. I pray for you and I keep praying for you. I don't stop praying for you. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul is saying, these are the types of things I'm praying. This is what I'm praying for you. And I don't stop, I just keep praying. There's um, Heather at the beginning of the service shared about the 24 hour uh, uh, day of prayer at our series campus. I wanna share something with you. This did not start with the leadership of the church. This started in a small group. A small group that's a part of our series campus said, let's do something crazy for Jesus. Let's pray for an entire day nonstop. And let's invite other people to do it. That's how this started. A small group said, you know, our challenge in the scripture is to pray and to keep praying. So let's try it. Let's see what happens if we pray and keep praying. Let's pray for 24 hours. Let's have 24 hours where we pray and we invite other people to pray. And they've invited you to join them. That's pretty amazing. When we read our Bibles, our Bibles help us understand of what a worthy walk in Jesus looks like. Let me just share with you some subjects we find in the Bible of what a worthy walk in Jesus looks like. It looks like purity, contentment, faith, righteousness, gentleness, humility, love, light. These are subjects we find in our Bible that help us understand what does it look like to follow Jesus? Wisdom, unity, Thankfulness, fruitfulness, knowledge, patience, joy, truth. I don't know anybody who says, I don't want these things for my life. I know a whole lot of people who go, no, this is what I'm trying to go after. This is what it is to follow Jesus. This is what it is to have Jesus come out of our lives when we're following him and when we're walking after him. In John, 1 John 2, 6, it says, by this we may know that we are in him. So this is how we know we are in Jesus. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walks. So we open our Bibles and we read about our Jesus, our Lord Jesus, our Savior Jesus. We read about him, we see his life through the scriptures and we see how he walked and we go, okay, how can I model after Jesus? Jesus is the model, so how can I follow after the model Jesus and see what it is he's doing? Okay, how can I follow him in the way he walked? So Paul, he says, hey, this is what I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your worthiness, that you would just follow after Jesus. He's called you. 
and that you'd be worthy of this calling that he's called you. The next two we're gonna look at, I'll share a little briefer about. The second prayer is fulfillment. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, again, it says, to this end, we always pray for you that our God, and then it goes on to say, may fulfill every resolve for good. So all the good things that God is wanting to have happen in your life, I'm praying that God would fulfill that in you. Every resolve for good, everything God is determining for good in your life, I'm praying that he may fulfill that in you. Listen to the Psalms. Psalm 21, one through two. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices and in your salvation, how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. How is it that a Psalm talks about a king having his heart's desires fulfilled? Well, when we look at a verse, we have to understand it in the whole of scripture. So let's look at some more. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. That's like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember that passage with six times it said anxious? In that passage, it said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you wanna have your heart's desires fulfilled, then set your heart on Jesus. Because when you set your heart on Jesus, then Jesus will give you desires that look like the desires of Jesus, and then your desires will be fulfilled because your desires now match what God is wanting to do in your life. So delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Have you ever thought, like, does God even, like, know I'm around have I ever made it to his to-do list? Does he know what's happening in my life? The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Is God even aware of my circumstances? The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. God knows exactly who you are and he's gonna get done what he wants to get done in your life. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and he saves them. Psalm 145, 19. Think about crying out in prayer. You know what takes my prayer to a whole nother level when I'm praying about my kids? It's a whole different gear. Man, there's, a, there's like a dad seriousness in prayer when there is tough stuff happening in the lives of my children. There is another gear my prayers go into. There is a intensity that I pray with there's a passion that I pray with when I realize I gotta go to battle on behalf of my young child. There's a great organization in town, it's called Moms in Prayer. Their goal is to have a group of moms praying for every school. I think that's awesome. I think it'd be awesome if there was a group of people who were praying for the kids at every school in every neighborhood, that'd be amazing. Prayer number two is fulfillment. Prayer number three is powerful service. So Paul's praying and he's saying, I'm praying that you, God will make you worthy of his calling. I'm praying that he's gonna fulfill every resolve for good. And now he says, to this end, we always pray for you that our God may fulfill every work of faith by his power. So that God will be working in your life for powerful service. This is what 2 Thessalonians 1, three through four says. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith, is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So your faith is growing and your love for one another is growing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and your faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions you are enduring. So even when it's hard and there's persecution and there's affliction and there are things that are opposing you in powerful service, I'm praying that God will increase your faith and he will increase your love and you will stay in powerful service to Jesus. I was so encouraged in the recap video that we showed at the beginning of the service of this past month of ministry to see that there was a group of people who were willing to go to the battleground of Coffee Road and pray and stand in our community and pray that the lives of unborn babies might be saved. There's going to be opposition in prayer. 
There's going to be opposition in powerful service. And what Paul is doing is he's saying, I'm, I'm praying that your faith will increase and your love will increase for this powerful service that God has for you. I just invite you, there's going to be another prayer walk the second Saturday in November, and it might be you want to join in praying at the battleground of Coffee Road. And we invite you to do that. So, Paul's praying and he's saying, there's these three things I'm praying. I'm praying that God may make you worthy of his calling, that he would fulfill every resolve for good. And I'm praying that he may fulfill every work of faith by his power. Now, what's it gonna look like if God were to answer this prayer? So if you begin to pray like this about your own life, if you begin to pray like this about your loved one, your loved one who you've been praying for, your loved one who you're really wanting God to do something amazing and good in their life. When you drive into your neighborhood and you're praying for your neighbors, when you're in relationship with somebody in the community and you're praying, if you start praying like this, that God may make them worthy of his calling in their life and that God may fulfill every resolve for good in their life, you start praying like this, that, that God may fulfill powerfully their work of service that they're gonna give, their work of faith and service to him. What's it gonna look like if God were to answer it? Well, that's what verse 12, this is a very short prayer, a very powerful prayer. It's packed full of stuff, but verse 12 is the answer of what it looks like when God answers this prayer. Verse 12 says this, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. When we are praying, are we praying types of things where the answer to the prayer is glory, the glory of Jesus in the life of ourselves? So when I'm praying, the things that make my prayer list, do they end in the result of Jesus being glorified in me? That Jesus being glorified in my loved one, Jesus being glorified in my neighbors, Jesus being glorified in that person I'm praying about. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the answer to the prayer looks like. So when you think about the last seven days of your prayer and you think through the transcript of your prayers of the last seven days, what would the next seven days of prayer look like if the answer to the prayers you're looking for sound like this verse? So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in your loved ones, in your neighbors, in the people that you're in, in relationship with in the community. How would that change the way we pray? And that's what Paul is showing us here. He's showing us these prayers for the people of God. They're very high prayers because they end with the answer of Jesus being glorified. Incredible, incredible. I'll end with this. The best prayers Use the best words. The best words are God's. The best prayers use the best words. And the best words are God's. So when you run out of words, good. Now you can get to the good ones. When you run out of things to pray, turn the page. Because God has given you his word. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So let's pray God's word back to him. Let's get our hearts for our own lives set on God's word. Let's get our hearts and our prayers for our loved ones set on God's word. When we're praying for our neighbors, let's pray like God's word sounds for our neighbors. That person that we're in relationship with and we've been praying about them for a long time, let's pray God's word because the best prayers use the best words and the best words are God's. So let's use his word. Let's pray God's word. If we prayed God's word for the next seven days, would it look different than the transcript of our prayers over the last seven days? And maybe today is an encouragement for me and you're just getting to hear it. Maybe today's an encouragement for me to pray God's word over the next seven days. And it just happened to be a public encouragement that God wanted to give me. And maybe you'll be invited to do the same. 
that we'll open up our Bibles and we'll pray God's word. Let's stand together. Father God, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to hear from Tengu. Incredible, incredible to have him here, that we could hear directly from him, not in a report, not in a photo, not in a video, but to actually have him here and to hear directly from him. Lord, thank you for the privilege it has been to partner with him for 14 years. Thank you that Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ and they're being baptized and they're being discipled and they're learning to share their faith. God, here we are in Modesto or a community around this town. This is, this is where we are and we're asking you to teach us to pray. We're asking you to help us dig in. So Lord, draw us to yourself, draw us to you and may we be changed because of it. Lord, we need you. We need you. And so we say, Lord, teach us to pray. And would you be honored and glorified in our lives? And would we learn to pray prayers that have the answer of you being glorified in our lives? And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen. amen.